Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Off-Grid Electrification and Impact Fundamentals webinar, the first of a long series of webinars. Um, I want to remind to all the participants that this webinar is mainly designed for participants in the Efficiency for Access uh, Design Challenge. So thank you all for attending. External people are obviously more than welcome. Um, so today we'll talk about the fundamentals that students need to participate in this competition to get to understand the context and understand um, understand uh, the competition. Can you please um, confirm you can hear me properly by raising your hand, which you should be able to do in the small box. Uh, go to meeting. Mm -hmm. I guess it's okay. Um, okay, I'll assume it's okay. <laughs> um, you can ask questions throughout the whole webinar um, in the question box, likewise. Um, thank you for raising your hands. In the question box, um, in the go to meeting, um, so you will find it, you can type them and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. We have planned 20 minutes for answering your questions. Uh, this webinar, like all the other webinars, will be recorded, so you will find them on the Efficiency for Access um, website. Um, and I'd like to introduce our speakers for today now. So today we are going to listen to Garrick, Garrick Lee, um, who worked more than 12 years uh, on energy access in developing countries. Uh, Garrick is a senior consultant for Energy Saving Trust and uh, for Gogla as well, so Gogla being an off-grid association for the industry. And we'll also listen to Leo. Leo, a British born living in Washington, D.C., that worked over 20 years in Africa um, as an off-grid solar product designer, social entrepreneur, and technical and strategic advisor, also working for Lighting Global and the World Bank Group. Um, Leo, I will leave it to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Theo, and hello, everyone. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to share these insights with you. And I'm just going to jump straight in. Um, we're starting off to give you the context of off-grid electrification, the challenge that we see. Um, and then Garrett will move into the technology section, looking at some of the appliance solutions that are presented. Then we'll move into showing the impacts of, that these can have on the situation, um, and then finish with questions and answers. And then um, our collaborators from industry will pick up and give you a lot of perspective um, on uh, individual issues. So really, if you didn't know already, <laughs> um, starting off, oh, actually, yes, let's stick on the first slide. Really, there's this, this crippling injustice that we see in the world now in terms of energy access. Two billion people plus are actually living in what we define as energy poverty. Um, and as you can see here, the majority of these people are in sub-Saharan Africa with isolated pockets around the world. And not only are they living without electricity, that's generally also um, because they're living in rural areas. Along with this, there's a whole other, uh, at least 1 billion, around 1.3 billion um, people living with what we call in weak grid um, or in some form of unreliable access where many places um, already do have some kind of grid, but often only for a few hours a day and very unreliably. A uh, final point here is that um, what has been measured as access is a very critical point that, um, for everyone to be aware of, that it can literally mean there is a power line going above your house and you are included as having access, because if you could afford it, you could connect to that. However, in reality, that still leaves hundreds of millions of people on that of the two billion who are more than two billion, because that two billion is people who literally have no chance of getting electricity. There's a lot more people who are near enough. But as we will see, if we move on to the next slide. Again, the majority of all of these people are living um, in Africa, where you can see these lines at the bottom. The blue, the bold blue line at the bottom um, represents the whole of Africa, um, except from North Africa. We also have a lighter line in South Asia, slightly more, 
but still a significant amount of people without access, which generally translated back in 2016 to only 40% of those living in, across sub-Saharan Africa having access. And that 40% means that they lived within a pole that could bring them access. So obviously the real number is much less. We can't consistently have numbers um, in between 10 and 18 percent across sub-Saharan Africa of the whole populations in rural areas having access. So very dire situation. Um, another key point is that it was only in the late 90s that there was even the recognition of energy access itself being a goal of development. Um, and energy poverty was literally coined for the first time only. In, in the late 90s in a report by the DFID. I was uh, studying my undergraduate at the time and started getting interested in these issues. And um, it was a remarkable, at uh, that time was the first after decades of various different forms of development. And so where we have brought us to by now is that um, only about five, five years, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact time, but the Sustainable Development Goals were launched um, maybe it was around 2012, uh, where we had the first ever definition of um, sustainable energy for all being a goal. Um, and that was one of, this, of the 17 SDGs that we'll look at later, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, underneath the United Nations framework, aiming at how to um, have a world without poverty, basically be one of the main challenges there by 2030. And at that time, that was the first time that um, there was a shift in the way that energy was viewed as itself as one of these goals. It's called the SDG 7. And that has been a rallying call that's led us um, very far um, in a very short amount of time. If we could move forwards. What you'll see here is I wanted to bring now into context um, how the technology has played a role in, in this area. If we can move. So for those of you, if you're as you're working on the design here, you'll all be very keen to know the role, um, if you like, the technocratic impact we can have um, on, on development. And quite simply, there's one statistic, um, which is the PV power uh, generation uh, price, which has been dropping over decades and decades. And I'll go into, uh, we wanted to break this down first before I put this into context in a minute. But um, clearly, when we're looking at rural electrification, um, the majority of rural electrification is coming through connection to one central grid, like we all um, live in in the West or in the majority of cities across the world. However, off-grid electrification has been largely dominated by independent power generation um, from solar photovoltaic panels. And what we've got here um, is a very brief snapshot where you can just see dramatically um, over the last six or so years, in 2010 and 2015, the massive drop that has since that time stabilized with solar panels cost. Um, and for context, going back here, it wasn't long ago in in the in 2000s, almost 20 years now. But at that point, solar panels were considered a complete luxury, a massive, massive um, exclusivity around them. Very few people would even dream of being able to access a significant amount of power to solve a rural electrification challenge. And around 2002, I'll give you an example of this, in Uganda, one of the World Bank's first ever off-grid electrification um, schemes to use new technologies such as promoting solar home systems was using funding from the United Nations Global Environment Facility to offer a subsidy of three and a half dollars per watt for solar modules installed. And now you can see that here we are, um, last figure here in 2015, showing under half a dollar per watt commercial cost of photovoltaic cells. So that just gives you an order of magnitude there 
um, of, of how things have really dropped and why solar panels now are the go-to solution for providing decentralized um, off-grid electrification. If we can move forward, if you like, um, solar panels are the main simple power source of how to generate your power. Now, once you've generated power, you can either use it directly, which only works obviously during the day and even doesn't work when clouds pass. So what generally some form of storage is needed. And for the majority of off-grid electrification cases, we're not working on um, any of the revolutionary new technologies you may be aware of on battery storage. Really the revolution here is moving from glorified car batteries, lead acid batteries, which have been the traditional um, solar battery with a bit of modification of the last decades, moving away from those towards more modern forms of batteries, such as the lithium ion um, phenomenon. And so the lithium ion battery price drop, again, is representative of a revolution um, on this time for battery storage. And you can see these prices here um, dropping from a massive $1,000 per kilowatt hour only in 2010. Um, to where we are around now, um, under, well, we're actually just around $200 um, less right now, um, going much lower. And again, in context, when I started this work um, back in around 2000s, I was using what may, you may not be familiar with, nickel cadmium batteries, these awful rechargeable batteries. They were the best we had, and the revolution was nickel metal hydride. Um, and using any of these batteries, um, has been a massive chance for us to take um, advantage of economies of scale. So what you're seeing here are the prices, thanks to lithium iron, being in everything from our phones to our laptops to now cars, scooters, bikes. If you can imagine, the huge volume of all of that production has massively dropped the price, um, especially power tools as well, for example. So many of these existing battery technologies are what have enabled this situation for battery storage to revolutionize and that's what i just really wanted to drive home we now have a wonderful situation where solar module for power generation are relatively so cheap same with lithium-ion battery storage um, and with those two um, getting together you'll be able to see uh, the massive piggybacking effect uh, this will only get bigger as electric vehicles really kick off, and that will then enable much larger lithium-ion batteries to also be lower cost. But at the moment, the massive price drops are particularly in the smaller batteries, which work perfectly um, for the smaller solar home system kits and solar lanterns uh, that we will move on to next. So this is an example. Um, again, going back um, even 20 years, there really was next to no solar kits in existence. Um, we have the concept of solar home systems that were used as a separate, very complicated um, technician installed energy solution where a technician would literally have to get a single battery, a charge controller, a solar module, DC lights, cabling, switches, cut it all, measure it all, connect it all, customized one-on-one, -on -one, such as if one could only get a suit by having it tailor-made. That was the solution for solar modules. Um, and the early rural electrification initiatives had to fund massive rollouts of training programs and bulk procurement of individual batteries and have a whole fleet of those being installed in rural areas. This had a huge amount of challenges, as you could well imagine, in developing world contexts, predominantly with massive failures arising from poor installation and poor component choice. So no matter what one could do, there was a frustration where you had high prices of solar modules, relatively inelegant battery options of lead acid, but this potential for solar to do so much. Around in the early 2000s, this was when, as I say, enter the dragon, Chinese mass production started to revolutionize this. And that was when we saw the emergence of the first solar box kits, which were like a little telephone switchboard. Um, imagine a me little metal lunchbox. When you opened it up, it had a small solar panel on one side, holes for stereo jacks, 3.5 millimeter, you, 
um, jacks where you could plug in lights. I got my hands on one of these in 2000 in Uganda from a Chinese contractor who had started up a small local business after working to build in um, the dam um, for power generation in the country. And that's just another example of how these innovations can spread. And he had brought over a small shipment of these kits to test. I got my hands on one, changed my life. I could just say this would be the future um, and have stuck with it myself ever since on various different levels um, of personal design challenges and then later small business. But um, the point I wanted to get to is since then, we now have into around 2008, um, the growth of solar home system kits where they were being revolutionized to have small plastic packaging. And what we see here is the actual solution, which has now brought hundreds um, of thousands of solar kits to people across East Africa, MCOPA, having a solar box with this lithium ion battery technology, including television package, solar panels, lights, and using um, the pay-as-you-go technology of using uh, mobile phone credits to enable customers to pay for this slowly over time. That has, is literally the technology that goes all the way down to a couple of watt solar module with a few lights, up to five, eight charging mobile phones, and then up to around 20 watts and beyond being able to power TVs as well. So that is the technology that we're talking about when you hear a solar home system kit. It's an electricity connection in a box there. If we can move on. That encapsulates what the change that we've seen under the Sustainable Development Goals is created what's known as the multi-tier framework. And if you look at the bottom line here, the Sustainable Energy for All, SE for All tiers are defined as measurable ways of attaining different levels of electricity access. Before that was created, there was simply a binary concept of do you have a grid connection? Yes, tick, or no. If you had a grid connection, your house was connected. That was the only way the international development community accepted for recording off-grid electrification access. Solar home systems did not count for governmental um, planning purposes or for international targets. So as you can imagine, that created a whole new revolutionary way of working if we can move on, what that ended up doing was using that SE for all framework, uh, which you can find out more about, by the way, on the um, SMAP study from the World Bank, redefining energy access, the hyperlinks in the last slide, and there's a slide at the end giving a bit more detail. But what that ends up showing us here, why this is so important is the gray space on the top right hand corner. All of what I was just saying to you is trying to get to the point that with conventional off-grid electrification strategies, there is simply no way that getting a grid to poor people in a widely dispersed, challenging environment, it cannot be economically feasible, even technically feasible. And that has been the challenge for decades. There was no solution because of the high prices of solar panels, the technological challenges. We literally now have had for the last 20 years, the opportunity to change this. And that is the space in the top right. Solar home systems have just moved to a mass commercial market through the dedicated support of the Lighting Africa, Lighting Global programs um, and other work of international donor partners. And this is the area that we've been focusing on because of its proven commercial demand. There is the mini grid space, which is also providing a great amount of hope for many people. And there's still a lot of ongoing research into how um, much uh, access can be provided through mini grids, but essentially you have the same challenge, making a grid, laying physical wires. If you like, it's um, akin to the old world of telephone connections, uh, where you simply have poles and you have to string wires. Any problem happens, connection broken. Um, so, uh, and incredibly expensive, massive logistical challenge. So there are the right circumstances for solar home systems to revolutionize off-grid energy access. There's the right price. And now we are seeing companies have been innovating with radically um, new technologies, which you'll be seeing over the next month. Um, they are the only solution that can work, as you see there. For, they are planned now in the world to at least one quarter of off-grid people nowadays can be 
um, reliably connected using solar home systems. We could move on. And yet, this is what I wanted to just finish with um, conveying the sense of the challenge to you. Let's remember that all of the work we are doing is occurring in developing countries where they have massive um, political, economic, social, geographic um, obstacles to development. That is why the situation is the way it is now after so long. Um, and so this uh, web is a indicator of overall um, political environment um, which was needed in order to successfully achieve energy access. Um, you'll see the RISE database um, which is uh, able to provide a lot more of these statistics for every single country now um, in the world. What I just wanted you to get here was on a scale of 100% um, being the outer circle. Just have a look there at the challenges that you have in all of these basic elements of um, a functioning political framework um, for energy access. You have very little across the whole spectrum. In that situation, now imagine building a grid, building any large macro project. It, that's why it is so challenging. And that is again, while the circumstances favor small off-grid solutions, um, such as solar home systems. And on my last slide, uh, if we could just move on, you could just see now, this is a way for you to remember the ecosystem of players um, that are involved in order to get solar home systems or any mass product um, to the end users. Um, and you see on the top left, those OEM, Chinese manufacturers, who can make a custom design for you or just off the shelf what they have to put your brand on with some small design tweaks. Um, that's where a lot of this work has begun. Um, you then have individual branded manufacturers where you can go um, design your own products, but you're relying on others to distribute and bring that to market. What we've seen in this um, off-grid solar sector are that there are some companies that literally do it all um, from manufacture to distribution, and yet this has become incredibly challenging. Um, and what we're now seeing is the disaggregation of the um, distribution uh, channel. And that's where you could come in. You could see how many opportunities there would be um, as a designer there to, um, for you to design with all of these different groups of manufacturers there, or even just to work on the end user circumstances to learn designs, to feedback into others. Um, so with that, I know we're running short on time and forgive me for running slightly over there, but hopefully that gives us a firm basis um, now to ground over to Garrick on the technology section. Hi, uh, yeah, so I'm going to provide a brief overview about why efficient and affordable appliances are important when it comes to energy access. Next slide, please. So the Efficiency for Access program under which this design challenge operates has a theory for change or theory of change rather. Uh, this can be summed up in this sentence, appropriately designed and highly efficient, uh, highly energy efficient appliances fundamentally improve the economics of energy access, maximizing the value of every available watt and putting modern energy services within reach of millions worldwide. So this is illustrated in this graphic where off-grid solar plus appliances uh, results in reduced upfront and life cycle costs and improved service delivery and uh, more affordable scaled access to modern energy services. Next slide, please. So how does efficiency actually improve the economics of energy access? This chart comes from a 2015 study that I worked on, which was a collaboration between uh, the Schatz Energy Research Center in California and the University of California's Energy and Resources Group. Um, we looked at cost and performance data of solar home systems and appliances over time. And the specific appliances we looked at were a 19 inch TV, radio, mobile phone, charger, and four lights. So based on this data, uh, we could see that when you use the most efficient appliances um, rather than conventional standard appliances in a solar home system, you can reduce the size of the battery and solar PV panel and maintain the same level of service for the user. At the same time, uh, the overall cost of the system comes down because even though the appliances cost more, the reduction in the cost of the battery and solar PV uh, more than make up for this. So the 2017 figure here is, uh, is a projection 
based on the historical data and the forecasts we had um, at the time in 2015. Uh, and so this graph um, is focused on solar home systems, but in recent pilots, the use of uh, super efficient, appropriately designed uh, appliances have provided a, a much needed boost to mini grid business models as well. Next slide, please. So we're going to have a, a poll here just to get some um, interaction and get, get you guys thinking a bit about efficiency. So let's imagine uh, the same solar home system with an efficient TV, fan, radio, four LED lights, and a phone charger, but we add on a conventional refrigerator as well. And so the whole system now requires a 700 watt solar panel along with a 300 amp hour battery to run. If we only change the refrigerator, from the conventional refrigerator to an appropriately designed, super efficient refrigerator, what do you think we can reduce the size of the solar panel and battery to uh, while maintaining the same level of service? So the poll should be up. And I'll let the, uh, the moderator decide when to, to go to the next slide. Okay, so the results were 29% um, of you think that you could run this uh, super efficient refrigerator and the rest of the system on an 80 watt panel and 35 amp hour battery. 43% think you could run it on a 120 watt panel and 60 amp hour battery. And 29% think you could run it on a 160 watt panel and 85 amp, amp hour battery. So the answer is number one, the 80 watt panel and 35 amp hour battery. Um, yeah. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is illustrated um, in this slide. Uh, you can see that to power the conventional refrigerator, you need almost nine times the amount of PV and more than eight times the battery capacity um, than you would uh, with a super efficient uh, refrigerator. And the cost of a system that size would be prohibitive for off-grid customers. So uh, yeah, you can see that if products are designed and developed explicitly for use in off-grid applications, it can potentially significantly increase affordability and unlock greater energy access outcomes. Next slide, please. So efficient appliances um, create a virtuous cycle uh, whereby improving the performance and cost of appliances increases demand for energy services, which causes the market to scale up as entrepreneurs and energy service companies see the opportunity and jump in. And this competition um, and scaling up of markets should increase demand for appliances, which should ultimately feed back into improvements in the performance and cost of these appropriately designed uh, appliances. Next slide, please. So there's a, um, there's a portfolio of appliances uh, on the market and at the horizon of innovation. And energy access can be seen um, as a stack based on income levels and consumer demand, where consumers decide on obtaining appliances um, in addition to what they already have based on their income and energy demand. So solar lanterns and mobile chargers are the most mature appliances in the energy access context and are more universal um, to off-grid households with energy access. Fans, radios, TVs, and refrigerators are emerging appliances that some off-grid households with energy access have. And at the, at the top of the graph, you can see um, electric cookers, irons, and sewing machines, uh, appliances on the horizon that are expected to be the next popular appliances for energy access consumers. Next slide, please. So we're gonna have one more poll. So how do we achieve efficiency improvements? There's a number of technologies and designs that have been identified 
And one such technology is a brushless DC motor. So uh, the efficiency, so for this question, the efficiency of conventional, conventional refrigerators um, has been analyzed and it's been identified that its efficiency can be improved by 60%. So what is the potential contribution of brushless DC variable speed compressors, which are brushless DC motors, to this efficiency increase? Can we bring up the poll? Yeah. So the options are 1, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, or 50%. So what's the contribution that brushless DC variable speed compressors can have to improving the efficiency of conventional refrigerators uh, by 60%. So this, this can be a bit confusing, but uh, let's just wait for the results. Okay, so we had 8% that said 10%, uh, 17% that said 20%, 42% that said 30% and 33% said 40%. So no one said 50%, but the answer is 50%. But yeah, there, there could be some confusion if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, 50% and next slide, please. Yeah, so the contribution of uh, of the brushless DC variable speed compressor to the 60% improvement is 52%, exactly. Um, so yeah, there, there could have been some confusion in the way that you interpreted that question. Um, but yeah, you can see it's a, it's a huge contribution that um, some technologies can have uh, to improving the efficiency of refrigerators. And this is just one case, one example of um, how you can improve the efficiency of an appliance. Um, next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit about productive use appliances. Uh, the World Bank Group Planning Global Program very recently released a study focused on productive use appliances and specifically productive use leveraging solar energy or pulse as they termed it. So they define this as any agricultural, commercial, or industrial activities leveraging solar energy as a direct input to the production of goods or provision of services. So they've uh, specifically looked at uh, productive appliances, productive use appliances for agriculture. And the reason for this is that agriculture is the single most dominant sector in rural economies, where the majority of off-grid populations are living. Agricultural transform transformations um, are high on government and donor agendas. And uh, pulse in agriculture is an important growth segment for off-grid solar providers to expand market and expand the market and deepen customer relationships. And agriculture has a unique set of impact mechanisms that create multiplier effects on incomes, consumer spending, and growth in the real economy. So um, yeah, you can see that Pulse productive use appliances that use solar um, can have a huge impact on uh, people's lives in off-grid areas. Next slide, please. So in this slide, uh, you can see what solar powered uh, productive use appliances for agriculture are that are currently available. So there's a few, there's three categories here. So the first one is irrigation pumps and uh, yeah, so there's different types of irrigation pumps, surface water pumps and submersible pumps, and they use between 75 watts and up to 22 kilowatts. Um, and then we have cooling and drying appliances. So chilling systems, for example, for milk chilling, are important in many rural areas um, with livestock. Uh, refrigeration um, could be household refrigeration. It can be commercial refrigeration for uh, restaurants or other commercial applications. Um, selling cold drinks is, is a, you know, a big money earner in many um, of the many rural areas. Uh, and uh, also refrigeration, well, okay, and freezing and ice making um, is also important in a lot of uh, hot countries. 
um, where many of the off-grid uh, customers are. And walk-in cooling units are, are part of the cold chain that's required to get um, goods from agriculture and from uh, farming, from meat and uh, meat and, and fishing to the uh, demand centers in towns and in cities. Um, so that's an important appliance. And fan cooling uh, for uh, either uh, cooling for industrial or commercial purposes, or um, it could also be residential purposes. And agro-processing is the other category. So flour milling, it's uh, self-explanatory, husking, threshing, hulling. So that's for rice, that's for maize, um, wheat, uh, threshing as well. Uh, so yeah, processing of the raw crops into something that's um, more usable and saleable. And grating, um, for example, coconut grating uh, is, is a common application. And then oil and nut presses, which is uh, pressing nuts and seeds into uh, to create oils that can be used in various other applications. I think that's my last slide. So I'll pass it back to Leo to, to finish off the, the webinar. Thanks so much, Garrick. Great. Well, I hope everyone, you can see that slide and just now get to grips with some of the reality here um, of the technologies that already exist uh, that can be both improved on and also see some gaps there. Um, anything of new innovation that uh, you can see. So what we're really emphasizing there, as Garrett said, was the agriculture technologies, massive transformative impact in these countries. And therefore, that's the big focus on agri-tech, but any of those different kind of productive uses. Alongside of that, there's, of course, what we also may not consider a productive use. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, you'll see what about all those other appliances used in the domestic situation? Just reflect yourselves. How many did you use already today? Um, can you really clearly define which of those helped you be productive, which just improved your quality of life, which made it bearable, which made you want to do all of this work um, in order to get those appliances? You know, all of these reasons here are often um, all wrapped up. So it's hard to say what are the impacts the technology, in fact, even energy access makes in someone's life. And so what we've done here, um, the uh, great colleagues who are under CLASP as the layer co-managers next to EST have taken the 17 sustainable development goals and looked and made a case for how actually having access to electricity services and obviously the appliances that transform that electricity into your impact in the world, 13 of these sustainable development goals are impacted by access to electricity. And you see this key there very nicely. Um, this, this really is, a, I think, um, you know, you could, one could literally just keep this slide and that alone could be a guiding point for all of this work. You can see at the bottom right in the key, the technologies that are associated with delivering on each of those sustainable development goals. It could even be a great creative exercise you just to imagine what are the different ways um, that electricity access to appliances could lead to realizing all of those goals. You may be motivated by just one of them, for example, that you'd like to make a difference in. Um, so in this area, uh, you could keep that for reference, as I say, and focus on the household appliances on the right hand side. That's just showing the flip side to the pulse that we just talked about with Garrick there. Um, all of those different um, points being made by refrigeration and how individual households or other areas could benefit um, in terms of the real impacts on people's lives. Uh, let's just move quickly into the next few slides and we'll get to a bit more reality here. So, so moving back to the power generation source, your solar home system in a domestic context or in a small business, that's the kit that someone could have um, to power any appliances in their home. Um, and there was a great um, full study on this. Last year, Powering Opportunity version one came out. We're literally just reviewing the next version now, um, Powering Opportunity two, and then that will give some just full of impacts of, of the uh, solar home systems. And again, this was simply not available even five years ago. There was no documentation of the real changes. So think how hard it must have been for designers and others to really work back without having a clear definition 
of the problem. Um, you're in a unique situation now where you could have only got that by going into the field before. Now there's so much wealth of reports that you could just encourage you to make the most of. So just very clear, simple thing. Have a look at some of these stats. I'm just going to pick out a few and encourage you to read the rest. But what you're seeing is people are literally making more money thanks to having those devices at home. Um, and these are transformative amounts of more money um, with people with often very limited opportunities there. Um, even on a more soft side, over 90% of customers feel safer with solar, with light at the switch of a uh, flick of a switch. You've got to consider the alternative was probably kerosene. Um, people using the mobile phones as a window to the world, health improvements because of the lack of fumes um, on their bodies. So these are just in the area of being studied of solar home systems. Um, but the main point is people are making more money, saving money, having new opportunities by literally being able to plug in um, to electricity, often for the first time in their lives. And imagine the difference that makes both in motivation and in practical sense for children. But moving now on to more appliance focus, um, here's a great example of solar water pumps. Relatively small study, but again, world first, of what is the impact of a small holder farmer getting access to a solar water pump. That means an individual farmer in their field, working away, never had maybe electricity before, or had to use kerosene, gasoline, um, in order to power a small um, pump. What we're seeing here, uh, the, this is the percentage of people who reported each of these um, life-changing impacts. Overall, as you see, 80% of people have found there's a true life um, improving quality of life change there. Um, saving money, improving their standard of living is always higher. That intangible air thing that just people felt better off overall. But in very practical ways there, improving nutritional value, increasing water security, decreasing how hard their life is, how much work they have to do, helping care for animals better. So massive variety of um, benefits coming from solar water pumps themselves, just to take one of the pulse technologies. I'd like to move on to the next. Uh, you can see the benefits there from refrigeration. Now, this may seem pretty obvious if you imagine life without a refrigerator. Um, but here, what we're focusing on are in a rural village where there may be no electricity or very little, um, vendors literally have no ability to cool produce for purchase um, by customers. And here, um, we foc overall focus that uh, many of the entrepreneurial uses of a refrigerator was, was in cooling juice, milk, sodas, um, in order for retailers simply to make more money and to deliver better service. Again, it may seem a small thing, but again, just in order of taking for things for granted that we have, how many of us want ice in our drink or want a cold drink when you need to be refreshed? So that kind of situation there um, can both be a great income generating opportunity for rural people who need more opportunities, as it is in order to run uh, profitable businesses, but more importantly, that they are actually delivering a quality of life benefit to people, which currently is limited to these few opportunities of chilling um, produce. We have similar um, studies underway to show the benefits from agricultural cold chain, um, from reducing food waste, from increasing food security. And of course, then there's the whole world of vaccine refrigeration, which is already very well documented. So if you weren't aware there, I just wanted to emphasize vaccine refrigeration is one of the most mature areas of refrigeration that exists with standards from the World Health Organization of what a vaccine fridge needs to, specifications it needs to meet in order to win their tenders. So that vaccine fridge has been a driver of commercial market and innovation over the last decades. It's this commercial use of fridge that we're seeing pioneering and being enabled now. And so on my last slide here, uh, before we move to questions, um, just wanted to move ahead. And what you'll see here, it's a little bit small. I apologize for this, but hopefully you can reflect on this later. I wanted to bring us back again to the reality here of where there are too many different drivers on technology development and particularly use. Again, reflect on what we're seeing here is in the yellow bar, there's a ranking of the development impact, if you like, if you're working on a philanthropic or a um, personal well-being 
measure, such as donors' governments often are, each appliance there is ranked of the potential development impact. And then this study worked on what the perceived consumer uh, attraction to each appliance was, unrelated to, um, if you like, the intellectual or aspirational overlay of how this should make a difference in the world. This is what people said they really value. What did they want in their life? What would change their world? And first up there is light, simple as that. Modern electric lighting, transformative in itself, soon followed by televisions, <laughs> smartphones, um, and then though very quickly we see refrigeration, fans, and um, a, a commercial business, if you like, mobile phone charging. But also important to notice how high up radios are perceived there. The, simple humble radio um, of how impactful that could be. And as you move down there, you see the laptops relatively low, um, electric cook stoves, a whole variety of different technologies. But I just wanted to draw the attention there um, to both these examples. But as you see in the boxes there, um, comfort is frequently cited as being the most important purchase driver for a fan. That applies to many other technologies. And one of the things just to consider here is um, technologies enable people to access the modern world, whether it's through a phone or it's just through having that device. If you maybe reflect yourself if, when you got your first smartphone or what another device it was, there's this intangible sense um, of inclusion which cannot be underestimated and on one level that impact is being driven through this work whether it's on a practical manner of a technology enabling a new service a new access a new quality of life or it's through, simply through enabling people to have the chances that we have and if you reflect back to the first slide um, it was refle reflecting on the injustice of the situation of the current energy access. So I like to think that energy access coupled with appliances are some of the great levelers in this modern world. Um, and if, I hope um, that you enjoy this exercise with us and feeling um, taking part in this innovation for development uh, exercise. And with that, I'd like to um, finish on the most important slide here. If you and overlay everything that we just talked about there, the most important thing to remember is that we might take for granted the role of gender. Whether it's in your classes, if you look around, design being often a male dominated area, or if it is just uh, the issue of who is using the product. And so the study by Energia um, is one of the world's leading NGOs uh, working in um, the role of women's um, development in overall um, national development. And we've got here a synthesis of the evidence from the five-year research program, which shows some of the key findings. Uh, I'd just like to share some of those. So overall, of course, none of those energy access targets are going to be met unless women's priorities are up there, forefront, along with what are their assets, their skills, limitations, capabilities, what are even the land rights, the gender norms, if women aren't allowed to own land, what's their incentive for actually putting their name down on the title deed for solar water pump to irrigate their land? All of these various um, levels are critical to bear in mind. Um, one thing I just want to emphasize here is if you just see the role of women in the supply chain, often women sales agents have proved incredibly um, successful here. You could look up the company Solar Sister, who's based its whole model on this. Um, and then, of course, we're seeing people in a position of power through accessing technology and being in charge of that. Um, it shouldn't be underestimated the the again the gendered impact of energy saving collecting firewood um, or pumping water carrying water think of some of the quintessential images of women maybe carrying water on their heads or of pounding maize with the big stick out the front i mean literally technology can transform um, these basic elements of people's lives and in doing so both on a simple level transform their experience and slowly start to change the role in society um, so with that, I'd like to hand back and open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo and Garrick, for this very insightful um, webinar. Um, I found it very interesting. So thank you very much. Um, so, um,
to all participants, do feel free to ask questions in the question box. So we've had a question from Nigel Monk that I will answer myself and I would asking about the refrigeration test method. Um, I recommend going on the Efficiency for Access website in the Global Leap Award section where you will find the test method and I can send it to you directly by email afterwards. Um, I'd like to start with the first question for you, Leo and Garrick, um, about why um, appliances in the off-grid uh, sector should work on DC electricity more than AC electricity because just for context, we've asked students to only work on DC electricity powered appliances. Um, could you help us out justifying why this is important and maybe also why this hasn't been researched in, in the past? I, I'm happy to take that, um, Leo, if, you, if that's okay. Yes, so, please. Okay. So, yeah, so generally in, um, in our houses, in everyday life, um, everything is run on AC, but actually a lot of the appliances that we use are natively DC. So internally um, in the circuitry that they use, it's, it's DC. So everything has to be converted from the AC out of the PowerPoint into DC um, before it's used internally in the device. So we, we can think about mobile phones, that's DC internally, laptops are DC internally, TVs, um, what else? Uh, yeah, most things without motors are DC internally. So if you think about fans, um, you can also run them on DC with a brushless DC motor, and they're actually a lot more efficient. They've been developed, um, refined over time, uh, and brushless DC motors are used in a lot of different applications, like drones, for example, um, and so they've become very efficient. So DC is, uh, you know, if we're using, if we're designing DC appliances um, and we're, we're using a DC power source, which is also um, what solar is, solar comes out as DC um, and, and when it's stored in the battery, uh, it's, it's produced as DC from the, from the battery, um, then we don't have to convert it to AC and then convert it back to DC um, for those appliances. So I guess, yeah, that's, that's, the main reason is because of the losses, um, the efficiency losses that happen when you're running DC appliances on an AC power supply um, and the conversion back and forth. Uh, yeah, does that answer the question, Teo? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a second one, maybe. Um, could you tell us a bit more about um, how mobile money and mobile payments um, allow solar home systems and, and mini grids to, to spread out a lot? Um, on a personal level, um, I think we have uh, a... So th there's a challenge here in terms of uh, the cost for all of these uh, solutions there. Uh, so what we'd like to point out is for a national electrification, if you think of that, of a government is driven to provide access. Um, the majority of, so there's a relative and there's a absolute cost. And I emphasize the relative first because this isn't happening in a vacuum. How are people going to get electricity? So that's where we've often put solar home systems as the most competitive for individual households in typical poorer people who make up the majority of those living in rural areas. Um, the cost of an electric grid is much more expensive. Uh, we have a cases of Rwanda where we had a $1,200 subsidy coming from the World Bank through a loan to the government in order to pay for a connection in one home. That was how much it was costing in a subsidy for someone to get access to electricity. Uh, and then those people wouldn't use the majority of electricity because they didn't have the appliances or the money to pay for that. So we now have a similar amount of electricity being made available for people's real needs um, with an $800, um, $500 um, solar home system. So what we are having now is a massive variety in cost, but the upfront cost of a small solar home system capable of powering a television is no less than around $400 um, in the market, often considerably more 
absolutely unavailable for the majority of people. And so buying products over time through what we'd often call higher purchase has become the solution where you pay slowly over time. And the revolution here has been through the advent of mobile phones and mobile money, creating the pay as you go, pay go revolution, where a technology has a chip inside it where it could be shut down by the owner of a product, such as the manufacturer M. Copa we saw earlier, who would then sell the product for a deposit and a monthly fee where the user would then rent it, if you like, to own. And that is one of the um, biggest solutions to the payment gap problem that we see. So if you put those few things together, you have solar home systems or standalone systems being one of the most affordable ways to get hold of, and the most reliable way to get hold of small amounts of electricity. And then if one can pay for that over time, that also enables donors or governments to again subsidize the cost of that product, making it more affordable for individual users. And we're seeing a lot of things happening in this area. The same can go for appliances. They could have a lock inside them um, so that the customer could not um, use it unless they paid for it. Um, but again, be very wary, productive use is one of the biggest problems there because as it, there's no solution to that yet because the last thing you want to do is shut down your customer's solar water pump and kill their crop. So there are limits still to the um, potential for pay as you go to overcome some of these financial barriers, but we're in the early days. Um, I personally think that we need massive um, continual amounts of development aid no matter what, as is conventional for the grid sector, um, is still um, almost wholly propped up um, by government and donor funding. Uh, if that is the incumbent and that is Goliath, it seems a bit unfair for um, the Davids of the small solar systems to be out to beat that um, without the same opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all people that attended this webinar. Uh, I want to remind all of the participants of the competition that uh, next week we'll be hosting a technology focused week. So every day at midday London time, there will be one webinar hosted by one of our industry partners. So people actually walking on the ground um, and each day will be focused on a different um, technology, starting with space cooling on Monday. I want to also remind the students participating that the challenge brief is a very good source of information if you don't know where to start with. A lot of links are in the brief um, that will lead you to useful resources, some that were mentioned during this um, very webinar. Um, and finally, um, Engineers Without Borders UK and ourselves, Efficiency for Access, are very excited to see you starting working on this project. If you have any questions, do get in touch with Engineers Without Borders. And I hope um, we'll see your project uh, starting very soon. Thank you all for your attendance and have a very good day. Done.